Welcome everybody. This is Trent Blizzard. I am the president of NAMA and I'm here with Brooke and Rachel. Uh, Brooke is our COO and Rachel is doing our presentation tonight. That's Rachel Sweeney. Say hi guys. Okay. Um, and uh, what I'd like to do is just do a, a, a little bit of uh, announcements, do a little bit of house cleaning, and then I will do an introduction and we'll, we'll, we'll hand it all over to Rachel to uh, talk about Santrell's or Santorell, if you prefer. I don't even know if it's plural, if I could add an S. So maybe you can address that along the way. Uh, yeah, um, Santorell's so, plural. Santorell is plural. And you <laughs> Santorell, you say the whole thing. So I'm going to work on that so I start saying it correctly. Um, so for everyone else, so uh, I'll start with the I'll start with the announcements. Um, let me uh, let me pop in here and go to the next slide. Uh, we have two forays coming up. I hope to see many of you at. We're really excited about our NAMA uh, MX23. That's happening in Mexico. The announcements have gone out. We have people signing up. It's a small and exciting foray for a small group of people led by um, Zachary. Um, now his last name has changed recently, so I wanna say Zachary Hunter, um, uh, but I'm gonna get it wrong, sorry, Zach. Um, uh, so Zachary is leading it out of Mexico. That's gonna be an awesome foray. It's on our website. I would encourage you to check it out. And then our big annual foray, Appalachia NAMA 2023, yay, um, uh, at the end of August is gonna be happening near uh, Hendersonville, North Carolina. Um, Let me just that'll, say, that'll be awesome. I I just did the site visit last weekend to this place. And I, I gotta tell you, uh, it's really nice. It is a beautiful area. The venue is frankly luxurious, maybe to the point of intimidation, but uh, I can't wait to promote this event and hopefully see you all there. It's really, really going to be spectacular. The Asheville Mushroom Club, shout out to Lori Yeagers and Frank Bartuka, who are among others, uh, busting their behinds to assemble a really astonishing diversity and abundance mm -hmm. of foray locations for us in just one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. I've heard great things about them too. I'm so excited. They're gonna, they're gonna be leaders in our, in our next event. Um, and, uh, also a shout out, I guess, from Rachel's standpoint, Rachel is, is, is involved with the Cumberland Mycological and the Asheville Mycological Club. So, uh, he's kind of local to, to, to this scene that we're coming to in August. Um, uh, so look for that, look for us, uh, look for us, uh, coming out to, uh, to those. And we, we hope to see you there. They're going to be awesome. Um, they promise to be the maybe the best food we've had in a while, the best lodging, the best facilities. Um, they're they're gonna be, a, it's gonna be a big event with a lot of people and a lot of speakers and hopefully the best mushrooms we've seen in years. So we never know, we, the weather has to participate with us on that. Okay, so enough about the upcoming stuff. Now I would like to uh, quickly uh, run through some house cleaning ideas on how this session works. Please note, we have a chat right in here. You can see the webinar chat. I, see a few of you in there. This is a great time for you guys to hop in here and say hello, tell us where you're from, make sure you can use the chat, it should be ready to go. Now you can put questions in the chat for Rachel. We also have a Q&A functionality and you can put them in there and they're, it's more private, like we'll see it. And what we're gonna do is um, uh, kind of monitor the chat and occasionally jump in and, and ask her some questions out of the chat and out of the Q&A as the, as the session progresses. And then maybe we'll have a, a little Q&A uh, at the end for whatever time we have left for a, a whole series of questions. So that's the plan. Um, so now I would like to do a uh, introduction of Rachel. Um, and I, I got a lot of words up here for you guys to see right now. Um, I will tell you that Rachel is based in um, Knoxville, Tennessee where she is at the University of Tennessee and she's like really close to getting her PhD. She's got a, a couple of steps still to complete, but hopefully we will uh, be calling her uh, Dr. Sweeney um, soon. Um, uh, she's, as I mentioned, involved in the Asheville and Cumberland clubs. And what she is studying for her PhD is called EB, which is uh, short for evolutionary biology. 
Um, Rachel's a National Science Foundation graduate research fellow uh, with a pretty big interest in field mycology and with uh, special, special regional experience in Appalachia and Patagonia. Um, today, she's going to give us a global overview of Santorel, and uh, she's going to zoom in and, and focus in on North America. So, Rachel, I'm sorry I left a few things out. Um, I hope you'll you'll fill them in, and uh, I'm I'm ready to ready for you to take over. I'm going to turn my video off and sit back and watch, and I'll jump in occasionally and interrupt you with questions as as it makes sense. Sounds good. Thanks, Trent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, let me share my screen. All right, hopefully that looks good to you all. So thanks for uh, coming out tonight and tuning in for my talk about chanterelles. I'm really excited to present to you a combination of some of my PhD research and a synthesis of what's been going on with all sorts of other chanterelle research. Um, in North America, and then also, as Trent mentioned, globally. So I'm in the final stretch of my PhD, and I've been focused on chanterelles and all of their assorted relatives, hedgehog mushrooms, and some other really interesting things, which I'll show you a bit of too. I want to start out by saying that um, I don't have to probably tell any of you this, but yes, fungi are very popular these days. Somebody who's not particularly mycologically inclined said to me the other day, you know, mushrooms are really having a moment. And I, you know, had to laugh and say, yeah, of course they are. Um, and if you're watching The Last of Us, you know, it's more than just mushrooms. All sorts of fungi are uh, all over popular culture these days. And uh, chanterelles, for example, a lot of people know chanterelles. They're delicious edible mushrooms, very popular all over the world. And yet, despite that, fungi are largely understudied, scientifically speaking. So you might have seen this statistic before that there are 2.2 to 3.8 million species of fungi on this planet, and that somewhere between three to 8% of them have actually been named and formally described. So those of us who are interested in taxonomy and systematics, how species are related, and how we classify them have a lot of work to do. And that includes even really well-studied groups like chanterelles. So hopefully I'll convince you of that later in my talk. Um, this was a, a paper that caught my eye the other day. Um, it basically analyzed a set of studies that had biodiversity in the title. So scientific studies that are trying to assess vari various facets of biodiversity on the planet. And what they found is that um, fungi are also the most, among the most understudied organisms uh, by scientists who are looking at broader biodiversity patterns. So it's really critically important that we continue to name fungal species, to describe unknown species, so that uh, broader science can also incorporate fungi into diversity studies more broadly beyond just animals and plants, which as you can see here are largely have been the focus of biodiversity studies. So moving on to chanterelles. Chanterelles, I'll be talking tonight specifically about genus Cantharellus. This is a, a broad group of fungi that, as I mentioned, are largely all edible. And so they are harvested from the wild, sold commercially around the world, and it's estimated they have about a billion dollars in annual commercial value, which is quite significant for mushrooms, right? So what is a chanterelle? Well, chanterelles are ectomycorrhizal, so they are obligate symbionts of common forest trees. And as such, they grow on soil in forested areas. They generally have smooth, clear spores under a microscope, and they'll produce something that's like a white spore print, might be a little bit off-white, have some color to it, but generally we would say that it's uh, white spored. And the spore bearing surface can be anywhere from smooth, completely smooth, to somewhat wrinkled, or can have well-defined, what I would call gill-like ridges or folds. Not really true, uh, true gills. I'll, I'll mention that here again in a minute. 
But here are a few examples of what those gill-like folds can look like. On the top there, the red chanterelle, you can see has really well-defined gills or gill-like folds. Whereas on the bottom here, you can see a couple of examples of uh, more like ridges or even wrinkled to smooth spore bearing surface. And you'll notice that they also are um, really similar to trumpets. So the genus Craterellus is sister to Cantharellus, the chanterelles. And um, they're also a lot of good edible species. So black trumpets, uh, yellow foot mushrooms, these are Craterellus. And it can be difficult to distinguish the two when you're first starting out. But as a general rule of thumb, the best way to distinguish chanterelles from trumpets is to cut them in half. And almost all chanterelle species have this sort of whitish pith or interior. Um, sometimes people say it looks like string cheese as uh, in comparison to, to uh, trumpet mushrooms, which are hollow when you cut them in half. So that's generally the best field characteristic to separate one from the other. And like I said, I'm gonna focus on chanterelles tonight. Um, could do a whole other talk about trumpets, but trying to just narrow my focus here to chanterelles tonight. So how do we identify species of mushrooms? In general, traditionally, we've always looked at morphology. Uh, what does the mushroom look like? You know, um, with the naked eye under a microscope, we would call that morphology. So for chanterelles, we look at color, size, shape of mushrooms. We also look at the spore bearing surface. As I mentioned, it can be anywhere from really lamellate or gill-like to totally smooth and anywhere in between. And of course, we use a microscope to measure things like spore size. And chanterelles often have uh, an unusual number of spores that they'll produce on the basidium. So where you see A here, that's uh, a basidium with the spores attached. So these are the cells that uh, produce spores on the gill edges. And so chanterelles can have anywhere from two to eight spores per basidium, whereas normally a lot of other mushrooms have two or four spores on the basidium. But still, it can vary even within an individual or a species. So it's not always the most informative characteristic. Spore size can be helpful. Um, most chanterelles have clamp connections. Actually, all chanterelles you're going to find in northern hemisphere temperate forests, like North America, are going to have clamp connections. Um, but there are some species actually in the southern hemisphere and the tropics that don't have clamp connections. And so this was a characteristic that was originally used to distinguish Cantharellus and Craterellus, but the line is more blurry than it was originally thought. And then, as I mentioned, chanterelles have smooth, clear spores under the microscope. But what's really become more um, apparent is that habitat's really important when we're thinking about species identification, particularly for chanterelles. So it's good to note which trees are present. And as I mentioned, since chanterelles are ectomycorrhizal, so they uh, must form a mutualistic relationship with trees in order to live and reproduce, you wanna look for certain tree species when you're in the forest. I've listed a bunch of the most common ectomycorrhizal tree species in North America here. It's not an exhaustive list, but as you can see, things like oak, pine, fir, uh, birch, beech, these are some of the most common uh, ectomycorrhizal tree species. If you're out west, tan oak is another one. If you're down in southern Florida, sea grape, coca loba is another um, ectomycorrhizal shrub, shrubby tree species that associates with some chanterelles. So, very important to note things like that, as well as is the soil sandy or not? Um, you know, calcareous versus acidic soil, if you're familiar with those characteristics. Good to know about your habitat. And then last of all, we do sequence DNA from mushrooms. And this is what has really revolutionized our understanding of species concepts. And I'm sure you've heard this before with other groups of mushrooms as well. And what I've been doing is a lot of DNA sequencing of chanterelle mushrooms, particularly in, from Eastern North America. And so I'll talk about some of that DNA work tonight. Uh, before I move on to chanterelles, though, I did want to give you just a sneak into some of the really interesting relatives of chanterelles. So um, beyond chan chanterelles and trumpets, so cantharellus and craterellus, we also have at top here the hedgehog mushrooms, 
These are close relatives that are also good edibles. Um, you know, instead of having gills or um, gill-like ridges, they have teeth under the cap. On the upper right here, there are also uh, important plant pathogens like Rhizoctonia and, uh, and its relatives that can cause stem rot and root rot in agricultural crops. And those are actually in the order Cantharellales, so the same order as chanterelles, as is Clavulina there in the middle on the right, um, and Multiclavula below it. So Clavulina is one group of terrestrial coralloid mushrooms that are really common. Multiclavula is also coralloid, but it is actually lichenized, which is cool. So these are all really closely related to uh, chanterelles. And then we also have a bunch of crust fungi, corticioid fungi, which are thought to be um, the, the most recent common ancestor of all chanterelles and allies, the cantharellales, was thought to be a crust fungus. So this is maybe you could say an ancestral form of the group. And so there are a lot of interesting uh, crust fungi growing mostly on heavily decayed wood. So at the bottom here, bottom middle, we have Botryo basidium, an anamorph, an asexual stage, it's a bright red color, it grows on heavily decayed wood. And to the left of that, on the bottom left, is a cystotrema, cystotrema radioloides, which creates these incredible honeycomb-shaped um, bulbils that are sort of like sclerotia. So if you find this tooth crust fungus on a wood and you look inside the wood, you'll find these bulbils in, buried in the wood. Super cool. And then at the center there, you'll see an arrow pointing to a little orange blob. And that's actually a lichenicolous fungus in the cantharellales. So they grow on lichens, super tiny, difficult to spot. Um, but again, another close relative of chanterelles. So really fascinating um, evolution of forms in this group. Another thing to note is that the ITS barcode that we use for a lot of fungi is really not ideal for sequencing in chanterelles. And this is because the ITS uh, region has really elevated rates of evolution in chanterelles. And because of that, the sequence length can be um, really much longer than in other mushrooms. And because mushrooms have multiple copies of this ITS barcode, there can be variation within an individual and within a species up to 3% in chanterelles. And so that makes it really difficult to understand species. Um, you're trying to look for something that's much more conserved. And in chanterelles, that's not really always the case. And so it can also lead to the difficulty in just generating a reasonable sequence that you can read that's not messy. And so instead, chanterelle researchers have used a couple of other um, gene regions to sequence. And this includes 28S, which is also known as LSU, which is not great to distinguish species. It's a little bit helpful for deeper level relationships in a phylogenetic tree, but it's not like ITS discriminating closely related species. We've also used TEF1 and RPB2, and these are protein coding genes that are um, reasonably um, easy to amplify and I would say of the two, RPB2 is really the best. If you're sequencing um, for any kind of barcoding pro project, consider using RPB2 for chanterelles. It's also good for a lot of relatives of chanterelles. And in my experience, it's the easiest to amplify and it's really phylogenetically informative. So easier to distinguish species from one another using RPB2. But I'll bring these back up again later. So just keep this in mind. We don't use ITS. Okay. so. Chanterelles worldwide have an estimated two to 300 species. And there are many more names for chanterelles than that. Really, they've been, um, the name has been used broadly across time. So a lot of things were named chanterelles. It was discovered later on they aren't true chanterelles. So there are more than two to 300 species of chanterelles that have been named. However, researchers have gone back and shuffled things around re-examined type species. And um, we have a better idea now of how many species we know of globally. This is a, a map that I made showing chanterelle diversity globally by continent. And the first thing that you'll probably notice is that there's a lot of chanterelle diversity in Africa. And 
Secondarily, there, there's been a ton of activity describing new species from Asia. And then North America is by the numbers, the third most rich continent for chanterelle species. And then the other continents really are pretty low in species richness. And it's also important to note that by and large, there are not a lot of species that are shared across continents. A lot of species are endemic to continents, meaning they're only found on that continent. So um, yeah, we can discuss this more later, but it's just good to keep in mind that um, the center of chanterelle diversity is not Europe, for example, where chanterelles have perhaps been studied the most. Um, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done, but you know, we still have almost 200 known described species, the, almost all of which have molecular data to support them. So a lot of diversity across the globe here. African chanterelles, um, as I mentioned, the continent has a hyper diverse array of species, but they're also some of the most colorful species, really interesting from purple to uh, red, yellow, some that even have a grayish uh, gill surface or spore bearing surface. So uh, there's been a lot of research uh, into chanterelles from all over Africa, which is great. In Asia, we have, as I mentioned, a lot of new species, especially taxonomic work coming out of China the past few years, Japan and India. Um, I've no doubt that there are more species there than have been described, but here's just a smattering of a few. Particularly interesting is this little siphiloid chanterelle at the bottom, which was described from Japan. So it has these like almost floral cup-like shapes that grow really tiny at the base of trees and forests in Japan. And then in South America, although there's not a lot of species richness that we know of, there are some species that have been described primarily from uh, the northern half of the continent in Guyana and Brazil. And uh, they're largely absent from southern South America, temperate forests like in Patagonia. Only one species described from there. And then Oceania, there's also a smattering of species that have been described. Um, in recent years, there have been a species described from New Caledonia, for example, too, so beyond uh, Australia and New Zealand, uh, but overall lower species richness that we know of. And then moving on to North America, this is where we have at least 33 species. So again, uh, I'm going off of species that have molecular data and um, I know that not all species have been described in North America, but this is where we're at so far. And of these six or seven subgenera of, of Cantharellus, um, depending on which study you're looking at, only three subgenera occur in North America. So we have subgenus Cantharellus, which is largely our golden chanterelles. We have subgenus Parvocantharellus. Many, not all of those are brown, brown species of chanterelles. And then we have subgenus Cinebrinus, where we find red chanterelles. So I'm going to go through those section by section and talk about species. Hey, Rachel, can I jump in yeah. here before you move on to the North American and pop you a few questions? Sure. OK, um, we had one from Alan Rockefeller about um, the RPB2 primers, and he was uh, inquiring which primer is best for chanterelles. Yeah, so um, I often use B6F and B7.1R. Those are just standard RPB2 primers. They don't always work, so there are other primers. At the end, I'm going to put my email and feel free to email me if you want a list of other primer combinations that you could try. But start with B6F, B7.1R. Okay. He said, cool, I have those. Thanks. Great. Um, CT Perez is asking a specific question about South America and wondering why they have so few species. Um, 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 that person imagines that Argentina would be very diverse. Yeah. Well, I would say that Patagonia, um, the ectomycorrhizal community there is very distinctive and it's really dominated by things like Cordonarius. And there's a real absence of Rushula, um, chanterelles, and a lot of things that you find in Northern temperate forests. Um, so, you know, there may have been historical 
biogeographic things like continental movement that cause some of the diversity patterns that we see now? That's the short answer. I agree, though, it's interesting because you would think maybe tropical parts of South America would hold more diversity of chanterelles, but not so much, not to date. Thank you. And uh, our very own Brooke Reed has questions about be a birch being a host of chanterelles. And I don't know if that's something that will come up here a little later. Um, if you want to put off answering it, but he notes that Patrick Leacock has always been skeptical of that birch as a host, but he has sites in Wisconsin where he sees Santorals with a distinct birch preference and a different macroscopic appearance, and he would love to have any clarification you have on, on, on that. Okay, well, there is one species that I'm going to get to that was described from under birch. So... When I get to Cantharellus betularum, named for birch, um, that might be a species that I would expect up north under birch. So oh, hang in can't there. Wait to stick it to it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. There's very little studies on like host specificity in a lot of uh, macro fungi. So okay. a lot that we don't know about that. Okay, well, thank so, you. Please continue. That was the last of the questions for now. Great. No, these are good questions. So I'm going to launch into subgenus Cantharellus. But I have to talk about Cantharellus sibarius first, because this is sort of your stereotypical golden chanterelle. And if you have an older field guide, you might flip through and it says for your, your local chanterelle is going to be Cantharellus sibarius. And that's because for years we um, accepted that the species that occur in Europe are the same as the species that occur in North America. This is a species that goes back to way back to 1821 when it was described as the type species of the genus, meaning that this was the foundation for Cantharellus. It was described as um, sort of the iconic species of that genus. And what was found with uh, molecular data, once researchers started sequencing DNA of chanterelles, and this is really only over the past 10, 15 years, it was found that Cantharellus sibarius does not occur in North America. Instead, we have a cluster of related species that are also golden chanterelles, close relatives of Cantharellus sibarius, but not Cantharellus sibarius itself. And so Bart Bike, Valerie Hofstetter, researchers from France, uh, they've done a lot of work on chanterelles and they did a much of this research showing that and showing um, not only showing that we don't have Cantharellus sibarius, but describing other new species from North America that are relatives. So which golden chanterelles do we have? We have about 20 species in subgenus Cantharellus. And as I mentioned, a lot of them were described over the past 15 years because uh, it was realized that they weren't Cantharellus sibarius, but uh, molecularly divergent species that in some cases do also vary morphologically. So I'll show you some examples today and I'm going to start with Eastern North America. Oh, and I should mention that um, I just published a paper along with my PhD advisor, Brandon Matheny, that focuses specifically on Cantharellus in the Southern Appalachians. So if after this whole talk, you just can't get enough, feel free to email me. That'll be at the end of the presentation and I'd be happy to send you a copy of the paper. So um, I'm going to start with Cantharellus lateritius because when I go on iNaturalist, uh, I think one of the most common recommendations by the, um, the iNaturalist robot is that when people have a chanterelle, they have Cantharellus lateritius. This is known as the smooth chanterelle. Uh, I call it the original smooth chanterelle because there are actually more than one smooth chanterelle species in North America. But this was described first, and it was recently uh, epitypified. So Bart Bike and, co, uh, and, and his colleagues were doing research on chanterelles in the Gulf states in East Texas. And they designated an epitype, which is a collection that helps um, cement the interpretation of a species. There was no uh, useful type species to examine. And so they designated an epitype and said, this represents Cantharellus slatericius. And that was from East Texas. And based on DNA sequencing data, Cantharellus lateritius is really only known from the Gulf states. So Texas, Louisiana, Florida. By contrast, there is another species of smooth chanterelle that was described um, by Bart Bike and as well as Jay Justice, who many of you know, this is his photo of Cantharellus slava lateritius. And this is described from Highlands, North Carolina. 
This species appears to be much more widespread than Cantharellus lateritius. And we have molecular confirmation of this species from as far north as New York, west to Indiana, and south to Florida. And so in the Southern Appalachians, I've only found this species. I've never encountered Cantharellus lateritius, which makes me suspect that, again, there is a difference in distribution for these two species, although they can appear morphologically identical. And that furthermore, there's just a lot of morphological plasticity. This species, Cantharellus flavolateris, as I can tell you, can look like a lot of different things. Look at the difference in color, in how smooth or not smooth that spore bearing surface is. Um, the two photos on the left were taken about 10 feet apart from one another, but I sequenced both of those collections and they are molecularly identical. So a lot of variability within species. And you will see that this is not the exception, but the rule within chanterelles. Furthermore, there are 10 smooth chanterelle species worldwide. So this is a phenomenon that has occurred a couple times in chanterelles. And not all of these species are necessarily closely related. So we see like convergent evolution of this trait across chanterelles, which is interesting. Another golden chanterelle species is Cantharellus altipes. And this was described also from East Texas, but it does occur outside of the Gulf region. I found it in Appalachia under beech and birch. The defining uh, morphological characteristic is that the stem tends to be longer than the cap is wide. But again, you can see color really varies. There's often a little bit of brown in the center of the cap. And other than that though, it can be anywhere from a bright egg yellow to paler. Um, here are some more examples and, you know, maybe even pinkish tinges. It can be found in oak pine forests in Texas, which is pretty ecologically different than birch beech. So maybe it's hardwood associated broadly. It's also found in Arkansas. And this might be a synonym of an earlier described species, Cantharella septentrionalis, which was described from Michigan. But more, there needs to be more molecular examination of that original type and hopefully some other collections from up north. Another golden species that's pretty common, at least in the southern states, I'm not sure how far, far north the species goes, but it often occurs in a golden form. And then it also has a pink form. And this is Cantharellus bellutinus, which was named such for the volutinous or sort of velvety cap appearance, which is sometimes more obvious than others. You can see this photo on the left. It's pretty obvious that kind of um, volutinous covering to the cap. But I need to point out to you that this is not unique to Cantharellus flavitinus. On the right is a photo of Cantharellus flavolateritius, which I just mentioned to you is a smooth chanterelle. You can see that sometimes it's not fully smooth. And so the collection on the right was initially mistaken for Cantharellus flavitinus, but um, after sequencing, it's actually Cantharellus flavolateritius. And so now I've made a couple of collections where this is the case. This pollutinous hyleus surface is found in two different species. So you have to make sure that there's no smoothness to the, uh, to the gill folds. And if not, then it's more likely Cantharellus foliatinus. So again, there's a golden form, there's a pink form, they're molecularly identical, and the pink form is pretty distinctive. I mean, it's a big stocky thing. It's really beautiful. Um, and there's another pink species though. And some sometimes people have gotten these a little bit uh, mixed up. And the, the species on the left is Cantharellus persicinus. Uh, I believe it might be only restricted to like Southern Appalachians and maybe some adjacent states. Um, whereas Cantharellus velutinus is definitely a little more widespread. The difference is that Cantharellus velutinus is going to be pink on the top of the cap, whereas Cantharellus persicinus is um, somewhat pinkish in the gill folds, but the cap is more yellow ochraceous and it's much more slender. So you can see here, they look pretty different side by side. Okay, so how about these? <laughs> these are four different collections of chanterelles that can't be distinguished 
by morphology, can be distinguished by ecology or habitat. And it turns out they're really not distinguishable molecularly either. They all look kind of different, right, at a glance. Oops. But what I found is that Cantharellus deceptivus, Cantharellus flavus, Cantharellus tenuthrix, and Cantharellus phasmatis form what I am referring to as a complex. So they're really, um, they have, they don't have defining features. And when we look at the um, different gene regions, they tell slightly different stories. And it appears that there's still gene flow going on between these four different named species. That makes us think that they might just be populations of a single species instead of four separate species. But so we, we increased the sampling in order to conclude this. More sampling could be done. Um, it just seems that, again, chanterelles are really highly plastic. And just um, looking at very few numbers of specimens, concluding that they look different, maybe one gene says that they're different, may not be enough evidence to conclude for sure that they're a unique species. And so in this case, my hypothesis is that they're populations of Cantharellus tenuthrix. Um, but again, more work could be done here. They're pretty widespread. Three of these were described from Wisconsin, um, but we find them down in the Southern Appalachians. So a pretty broad range. So here's an example of Cantharellus tenuthrix, um, which I like to call the shape shifter. You can see how the gill folds can change from white to yellow, even within a single collection, you know, from, from young specimens to old. And these are found under conifers or hardwoods or mixed woods. So there's really no, I searched long and hard for ways to be able to repeatedly distinguish these as species that they were described as, but for now, I'm just calling them tenuthrix complex. It's sort of um, an identification of exclusion too. If you can't identify um, all the other species that I'm talking about, if you've, if you've excluded those, you can conclude that it's Cantharellus tenuthrix complex, but otherwise there's just not a lot of distinguishing features. In contrast, we were able to name one new species from, Chantere or from, from Knoxville, one new Chanterelle species from Knoxville that grows with oak trees. And I made a few collections from around town under oak trees and urban areas. And these are really robust mushrooms. So I know out west, you get a lot of real stocky chanterelles, but out east, you don't necessarily. A lot of them are small, slender things. And this is not, this is a big chunker. And I was really excited because, <laughs> you know, I do like to eat chanterelles, but I noticed that they were not like what I normally saw. And once I sequenced the DNA, I saw that it was not like anything else. One morphological clue is that the gill folds tend to turn a dark salmonish color when they're dry. And what's really cool is that I was looking through some of Stephen Russell's chanterelle sequence data the other day, and I noticed that he had sequenced a specimen from Bloomington, Indiana. So that's the first confirmation of Cantharellus fasinus outside of Tennessee, which is exciting. So it occurs again in urban areas under oak and it's pretty stocky so you know you might be tempted to eat it just know you might be eating a, a new species cantharellus vicinus rachel we have yes. a question from dave w he asks if you can quantify the geographic range for cantharellus tenuthrix complex yeah so that's a good question um I can say that it goes up to the upper Midwest, like I said, it's in Wisconsin. Wouldn't be surprised if it was further north up into Canada. It's down into the Southeast. Um, I don't, I'll have to check at the end. If you remind me, I'll check and see if there are other places that I have it confirmed from, but between the upper Midwest and the Southeast, for sure. I wouldn't be surprised if it's found elsewhere. But that's what I have genetic data for off the top of my head. And Rachel, we had another question from earlier in the presentation. So I'll yeah. throw that in here now too. It's from, um, I'm not sure whom, asking about the genus of the lichen coleus yellowish blob from the earlier slide. What, what was the genus there, please? Um, yeah, so there's there are actually several genera 
Uh, I believe that photo was Neo Burgoa. I could be wrong. Again, there are several genera. Feel free to email me or if you look up Lycanicholus cantharolales, there are a whole list of genera because these things are found throughout the order. Pretty cool. Thank you. All right. So moving on to Cantharella severus again, to bring it all full circle. So Cantharella severus, again, we've lived with this common knowledge for a while now, not found in Eastern North America. Fine. This specimen was sent to me by Carrie Lachance from Connecticut, found under birch and hemlock. And it was interesting because I sequenced this white chanterelle and didn't really have any expectations, but it genetically matched European specimens of Cantharella sibarius. So this is the first confirmed specimen of Cantharella sibarius in North America. So what's going on? Well, I compared that and several other samples from Atlantic Canada, the Northeast, Connecticut and New York, and Europe, where there's plenty of uh, Cantharella sibarius specimens that we have genetic data from, as well as China, where recently Cantharella sibarius was reported from with genetic data. Now, what I have here are three different gene maps, one for each of the three genes that I used. These are the three that I mentioned earlier, 28S, TEF1, and RPB2. So each tip in each of these little gene clusters represents one sample, either from, as I said, North America, Europe, or Asia. And so if we look at the top, gene one, LSU or 28S, you can see that there's like a pretty clear delimitation between uh, samples from North America and samples from Europe. They're different. They form two different groups, basically. Fine. Then we look at TEF1, the second gene. We see the pattern's a little more diffuse. It looks like things that are from Atlantic Canada and Northeast. There's a species Cantharellus analensis that was described from there. Those sort of cluster together. You have some specimens from France and Sweden there. And then you have something from Spain. And then you have a sample of Cantharellus roseocanus, which is from the Western US and Canada. And then you have China. So everything seems to be intermingled a little bit. And then you look at RPB2 and you see chaos, really. This Cantharellus severus specimen from Connecticut is really closely re related to the epitype of Cantharellus severus. So that is like, that is the holy grail. That is Cantharellus severus from Connecticut. Furthermore, it's not that distantly related from Cantharellus roseocanus. And so we see basically all of these different samples interspersed. And so these different genes have different, slightly different histories. And so they tell slightly different stories and, and that's okay. We expect that with um, sequencing. But the conclusion here is that Cantharellus severus is something like a species com complex because it may include Cantharellus analensis could include Cantharellus roseocanus. It, can, it includes specimens from North America, Asia, and Western North America. And whether or not it includes Cantharellus analensis and roseocanus, it seems like it is a circumboreal species. So here are all my samples highlighted. And here's my hypothesis that Cantharellus severus is actually a circumboreal species. So we have our sample from Connecticut, from Sweden, other European samples, and then Cantharellus analensis and Roseocanus, which I'm provisionally con considering part of this Severus complex. And if you're familiar with these species, you might be saying, well, how could these all be one species or part of a complex? And they may form just populations of that species, or they may be distinct species. Really, we need additional sampling from across that whole range, Asia, as well as Northern North America, and Europe to really understand this better, have limited sampling here for sure. But I want to show you about Cantharellus sibarius from Europe. What's really interesting is there's a lot of color variation that's been documented. So there are albino specimens of Cantharellus sibarius here on the left that were described by Ibai Olariaga and co-authors. And what they showed is that it's just very variable, it can be anywhere from totally white 
to at the bottom, you can see it can be bright orange. It can be pale kind of muted orange, orangish yellow. And this is a phenomenon that was also documented in Cantharellus analensis, that species I mentioned that was described from Atlantic Canada. Um, there's a great paper from Greg Thorne and co-authors where they show that the albino mutant variety of Cantharellus analensis lacks beta carotene. So that's why it's albino. And this is a phenomenon that's also seen in Cantharellus siberius. So could they be conspecific? It's probable, it's possible. Now, when you look at the, um, the figure that I showed you with this, these species relationships, um, you have the Cantharellus siberius complex. Sister to that is samples of Cantharellus subalbatus and Cantharellus caspiadensis, which are um, from Western North America. And so in our phylogeny, they're shown as sister to Cantharellus siberius complex. It's not well supported, but in any case, um, Again, very limited sampling, but one is a holotype of cascadensis. And this begs the question, are these two species the same or are they just closely related? Let's look at them. So Cantharella subalbitus is, again, a Western species that is known to be a white chanterell, whereas Cantharella cascadensis is a large golden species, both found in Pacific Northwest, up into Canada. And this is what Cantharella cascadensis looks like. So again, you might think, how could these be the same species? But there's this history now of chanterelles that are albino mutants, basically, of a golden, a golden form. And they can be conspecific, even though they look wildly different. So again, I can't draw any firm conclusions just because of the really limited sampling. But it's not out of the realm of possibility that chanterelles have been described on the basis of being one color or another when really some of those are the same species. Rachel, we have yeah. a really good question pertains kind of directly to this. Betty Bissell asks, any correlation between the color of Siberius complex members and environment or host plant? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Off the top of my head, I don't know of anything to do with um, host plant. Uh, the paper by Greg Thorne and co-authors is really interesting because it does talk about how beta carotene, you know, may aid in defense. So there are other, um, besides beta carotene not being expressed in albino mutants, you know, there are some other compounds too. And so there may be some sort of, um, you know, being a, an orange chanterelle might have benefits, but it's more likely, I think, that there's just some sort of glitch that creates an albino mutant. Um, I don't know anything particularly pertaining to um, like tree host or soil type. Okay. That's a good question. Uh, we have two more here. One is Becca Mahoney asks, do you think that drying specimens to record color changes would be helpful in deciphering species? And then Jean Fahey would like to know, is odor different between species? That's a good question. I haven't found any clear odor differences. Um, sometimes chanterelles don't smell as strongly as others, but I think that's, there are a lot of variables at play. It could be younger, older, could be how good your nose is. Um, and as far as drying specimens, uh, it's really important to note color when they're fresh. And then I guess the only case that I can think of off the top of my head is Cantharellus vicinus, where the gill folds change color when they dry it, or they turn notably reddish or salmon colored. But other than that, uh, there's not a, as much morphological information that you can glean from how a chanterelle looks when it's dried. Interesting. Okay, yeah. moving on. Thanks for those questions, they're really good. Mm -hmm. Okay, Cantharellus formosus. Here's another Western species that is another slender golden chanterelle. It was really described a long time ago. And um, this is a species that's supposedly found under conifers. It's more slender. It goes down in from British Columbia down into California. And in California, I'll show you in a second here, Cantharellus californicus, which was described in 2008, is much stockier in comparison to Cantharellus formosus. But really, um, there are just like five species that have been described from out west or species names that are in use. Cantharellus californicus, as I mentioned, this is a much stockier species that's found um, 
in association with live oak or tan oak in California, super stocky, often called mud puppies, which I love. I think that's a really good common name. Um, but we just haven't seen as much species diversity described from the Western part of North America as the Eastern part. Okay, so racing on to red chanterelles. This is subgenus Cinebrinus, and there are essentially four species that have been described from North America. And I'll go through these. The first is just Cantharellus cinebrinus. Um, this is your cinnabar chanterelle. You're probably familiar with this name because, again, this is probably the name you'll encounter in your field guide. It's thought to be a widespread species. It was originally described from Pennsylvania. We have molecular sequence data from Indiana, Tennessee, and Mississippi. Not that much, actually. I would expect more sequence data for Cantharella cinebrinus, given that it's this iconic species. But for so long, at least in the Southern Appalachians where I've been living, we just assumed everything was Cantharella cinebrinus. Why not? It's everywhere in the summertime. But what I found through sequencing is that it's actually far less common than another red species that was more recently described, Cantharellus corlinus, which I'll talk about in a minute here. But Cantharellus cinebrinus tends to have these really gill-like folds. So you can see these photos. These are sequenced specimens of Cantharellus cinebrinus um, from Stephen Russell's DNA sequencing efforts. And so these have really well-defined gill folds on the whole. And they do have a peppery taste if you taste them. But that's not totally unique because there's Cantharellus corallinus, which at a glance looks identical, right? This is our most common red chanterelle in the Southeast. Actually, everything I've sequenced from the Southeast has come up as Cantharellus corallinus, not Cinnabarinus. And so what I've realized is that this species, sometimes you can tell it apart in the field from Cinnabarinus. It often has these whitish patches that you can see here extending from the base or sometimes areas on the stipe or the stem that look sort of whitish, like there's, you can see the fruit body second from the right that has that sort of like whitish patch there. And that the gill folds are generally less gill-like. They're a little less blade-like, more shallow than in Cantharellus cinebrinus. Um, and it also has a peppery taste. It's a little bit delayed, but it's there. And uh, this has been sequenced from all the way from Indiana down to Florida. This is a, a collection that I made in Gainesville, Florida. So it's out and about, at least in that range. It does overlap though with Cantharellus cinebrinus. And as to which species is more common in the Northeast, I don't know yet. <laughs> and out West, which species do you have? I don't know. Um, a more distinctive species is maybe Cantharellus coccolobe because it occurs as the name might tell you, under sea grape, coccolova. And these are a couple of uh, plant species that, that occur throughout the Caribbean. And so this is, was described from Guadalupe, but it's also found in Southern Florida where coccolova is common, Puerto Rico, Mexico, anywhere in and adjacent to the Caribbean. And lastly, we have Cantharellus texensis. So this was described from Texas a few years ago in oak pine woods, but it might occur elsewhere in the Gulf region. And it supposedly has slightly larger spores than Cantharellus cinebrinus, which could help you identify it without having to sequence it. And interestingly, it's actually more closely related to that last species, Cantharellus coccolobe, than it is to Cantharellus cinebrinus. Okay, any questions about Red chanterelles or anything else before we move on? Any burning questions? If not, that's good. We have a question about the peppery taste. Um, yeah. You're assuming that's the, the raw mushroom. And, and do you mean about, you know, any tips on chewing, spitting after cooking? People, people are asking about the peppery taste. Well, um, because I research mushrooms, I really just taste them raw. I've actually never cooked. Uh, red chanterelles to eat. They're just so scanty and small. I go for the bigger prize. But um, so when you eat them raw, you can just hold them in your mouth, chew them around, wait for the peppery taste, and then spit them out. So that's like a less than 20 second process. If you, you can taste, you know, raw mushrooms that way. It's 
it's fine. Just spit it out when you're done. As far as cooking goes, I don't know. I'm assuming that some of that pepperiness cooks off, but um, you have to ask somebody else. <laughs> Never cook them. Um, it they, they tends to stay. They make the eggs peppery. Oh, there you go. So cook them with eggs. <laughs> That's good advice. So on the vein of Cantharellus cinnabrinus, we elevated this species, this to the species level. This was originally described by uh, Ron Peterson, who's an emeritus professor at University of Tennessee who studies chanterelles a lot in the 60s and 70s. And he described Cantharellus minor forma intensissimus. And that turns out to be a molecularly, and as you can see, somewhat morphologically distinct species. It can be variable, but fairly bright orange, and it has this sort of intervening in between those pretty gill-like folds, um, sort of like Cantharellus cinnabarinus does. And if you compare it side by side to Cantharellus minor, which is the small, slender, yellow chanterelle, um, you'll see that Cantharellus minor lacks that intervening, really intricate gill patterns that um, Cantharellus intensissimus has. And from what I've heard, Cantharellus intensissimus also might occur up in the Northeast. So it could have a fairly broad range. We've just um, found sequences or found chanterelles and sequenced them from the Southeast. So like North Carolina, Tennessee, South Carolina. Um, Cantharellus minor is also a really widespread species as far as we know. Hmm. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, talk about some brown colored chanterelle species. These are actually in subgenus Cantharellus and Parvocantharellus. It's not like all brown species are in subgenus Parvocantharellus. Um, they're not all closely related to one another. Again, there's a lot of morphological plasticity. Uh, and so habitat and also in some cases spore size are really important to distinguish these species. First up is Cantharellus camphoratus. This is a great species because it's found in really distinctive habitats and it has a couple of key features, which again, chanterelles don't always have, right? So this is found uh, as far north as, as the uh, Northeast North America, Atlantic Canada, I collected it in New York, and it's the chanterelle that occurs on Mount Mitchell in Western North Carolina. So the highest point of the Southern Appalachian Mountains actually uh, it's like 6,000 feet elevation. If you haven't been up there, it's just spruce fir, a little bit of hemlock trees. And that's where these photos were taken. And you can see really well here that it has fairly blunt gill folds. They can be merulioid or sort of squiggly like you see in that picture on the left. And there's this distinctive yellow band along the margin where the uh, cap edge meets the gill folds. And that's a key feature that was mentioned when the species was described by Ron Peterson from Nova Scotia way back in the 70s. And so when these get older, they don't always look clearly brown. They can look more yellowish. What's interesting when we sequence these is we found that the species also appears to occur in hemlock fir forests in the mountains of Japan. And we were able to infer this because we sequenced so many different genes. This is really important for chanterelles. Look at several genes. Initially, you can examine RPB2 or one gene, but in a lot of cases, we have samples from all over the world that have a couple of genes. And so if you can do a good multi-gene analysis, um, that's how you can infer relationships like this. So really cool. One of the few chanterelles from North America that's found on another continent as well, not common. And then Cantharellus betularum, here we are. <laughs> uh, our uh, chanterelle that was described under birch. This was also described from, uh, from Canada, from Newfoundland. And when I collected this in the Southern Appalachians, I thought it was Cantharellus camphoratus at first, because as you can see in the upper right, it can be quite brown when they're small little mushrooms. And they're found in this type of spruce fir habitat where you also find Cantharellus camphoratus. However, it's always found under birch which was also present in that spruce fir forest. Difficult to notice while I was so excited about the mushrooms, but this seems to be really under birch and it's closely related to a European species, species Cantharellus amethystius that has these sort of lilac colored scales. 
And so Cantharellus betularum can sometimes have that. The photo on the bottom is Cantharellus uh, betularum, but it doesn't always, not consistently. Another small brown species that you probably do know about is Cantharellus appalachiensis because it's widespread across the Eastern US and into Canada. It's brown on the stem and on the cap. And so it can be confused with a host of other brownish species, especially when you're down in the Gulf region where there are more species that I'll, I'll mention here in a second that have these sorts of characteristics. One is Cantharellus quercophyllus. As the name suggests, it's found with quercus or oak trees on sandy soils. And it was described from Texas and hasn't really been sequenced a lot since then, but I took this photo in Gainesville, Florida. So it goes at least as far east as Florida, but probably has more of a gulf distribution. Same with Cantharellus tabernensis, which was described from Mississippi and is found in pine oak forests in the gulf region. And this can be smaller like Cantharellus apalachiensis, but the gulf golds are supposedly brighter orange and People in the Gulf states know this species for sure. And then we have Cantharellus lewisii. This to me is the most um, easily distinguishable of the somewhat brownish species, because actually it, it looks more purplish, browny, scaly kind of appearance. And this is uh, was described from Texas, but it occurs up to Georgia, into South Carolina. Haven't found it in the Southern Appalachians, but more in the lower lying areas um, in the south. And it's actually not closely related to Cantharella spectularum or amethystius, the ones that have the lilac scales that I showed in the last slide, but it's closer related to a series of other species that look kind of like this, like uh, Cantharella spialacio vinosis, which is described from Mexico. So you can see Cantharella lewisii there on the bottom, really more closely related to these species from all over the globe. So here is Cantharella spialacio vinosis on the left, and it differs in spore size from Cantharella lewisii. I'm not sure if their ranges overlap or not, but there are only a handful of species described from Mexico so far. There are probably more that have not been described. Uh, in terms of Central America, Cantharella atrolilacinus was described from Costa Rica under oaks, and this has like a darker lilac gray cap. I don't really know of any recent collections of this. And there's no sequence available uh, to compare to. But um, yeah, part of our North American chanterelle diversity. So here's a sort of visual summary of the 33 known species. I tried to go through and map out what we know about where species are found regionally. Unfortunately, again, there's this yawning gap between Eastern and Western North America because there's just not been as much work done on chanterelles out West. But that being said, the lines show uh, species shared between different regions. And you know, thanks to sequencing efforts, like I, I mentioned Stephen Russell doing sequencing of specimens from Indiana. Who knew that you know, the Midwest had so many chanterelle species? It looks like it may be just as species rich as some of the other regions like you know, Southern Appalachia, the Gulf states, Northern Florida, which are also really species rich. And that's not to say that the Northeast is also not species rich, but there just hasn't been quite the amount of in-depth sequencing and uh, taxonomic analysis done yet. So like, same goes for Mexico and Western North America. But in the broader picture, so far North America is the most third most species rich continent for chanterelles. And that could be due to high level of habitat diversity you know, we do have um, some subtropical regions meeting with temperate regions, you know, some arid conditions and some really, uh, you know, wet forest types. Uh, so still a lot to be discovered in North America overall, but keep in mind, we also do have Cantharellus siberius. So that's a really interesting part of the puzzle. And does Cantharellus siberius occur in Western North America? We can't say for sure yet, but perhaps it does. Okay, so just a real quick note to say that uh, I was going to go through chanterelle lookalikes, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to say that all North American chanterelles are presumed edible. Uh, that's, of course, if you have fresh specimens, you cook them, you know, all of that. Don't leave them sitting in your fridge for two and a half weeks and then try and cook them. Well, if you live out west, that might be acceptable, but out east, we get 
you know, mushrooms do go bad eventually. Um, but as long as they're fresh chanterelles, you know they're good, right? And there are a few toxic lookalikes, but they're really easy to learn. Um, they're nothing deadly poisonous, mostly just things that would make you sick if you ate them. And the things to look for for chanterelles are these gill folds, which are easy to learn. You can rub them off really easily, kind of like modeling clay with your fingernail um, versus true gills. And most of the lookalikes that are toxic have true gills. And so just learning that distinction from practice is what you need to do. Furthermore, chanterelles don't bruise like dark brown or black, like one of the look like species does. So keep that in mind. Anything that looks unusual may not be a chanterelle, it might be a turbinellus. And then odor. Again, most chanterelles are sweet and fruity. Not always. Sometimes they don't have as much of a distinctive smell at all. But if it does smell sweet and fruity, it's probably a chanterelle and not one of the handful of lookalikes. And then again, that stuffed stem interior. Uh, if you're just trying to distinguish between craterellus, the trumpet mushrooms, chanterelles by and large have this, um, do not have a hollow stem on the inside. And as I mentioned, DNA sequencing, this gets to Alan's question. I recommend using RGB2 if you're involved in any sort of sequencing effort, if you're sequencing chanterelles. We have a really good database now on GenBank of RPB2 sequences for most species. And you can use primers B6F, B7-1R to start with. There are a couple of other primers on the lower right corner. I've also designed some chanterelle specific primers. If you're really having trouble, always feel free to message me. And you can also try TEF1 as like a secondary barcode if RPB2 doesn't work. But overall, RPB2 is great for chanterelles, also good for relatives of chanterelles, and very good for distinguishing species. So to wrap things up, I just want to acknowledge a few people, especially everyone in my lab at the University of Tennessee, the Matheny Lab, including my PhD mentor, Brandon Matheny, and Noah Walker, who is an undergrad student who did a lot of sequencing work of chanterelles, as well as Carrie Lachance for the specimen of Cantharellus spurius, Stephen Russell for sharing all of his sequencing data with me, and then my funding sources from the University of Tennessee, the National Science Foundation, and NAMA via the Mycological Society of America. So with that, thanks for listening. Um, if you would like a dichotomous key to species of chanterelles from Southern Appalachia, email me and I will happily send it to you or a copy of the paper that I mentioned or any other questions that don't get answered after this. Thanks so, thank so much, you. Rachel. That was awesome. Um, I, we have a few questions lined up here for you if you're ready. They yeah, are, I'm ready. Sure. They are uh, diverse and varied. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'll start with um, Dave W. Ask if there's any host differences for the Cinnabarinus versus the Coralinus. In southern Appalachia, again, because I haven't, I haven't found Cinnabarinus, I haven't confirmed it. Um, I couldn't say. I don't think that there are. Um, Cantharella Cinnabarinus was epitypified from Cades Cove, which is right in the middle of the Smoky Mountains, and. Um, I've collected uh, Cantharellus corallinus from right in Cades Cove. So um, I suspect they occur in the same habitats. Um, Alicia Milliken noted for comment that um, golden stand ferals in Alabama were seen to taste peppery. Interesting. Well, you know, I, I'd love to find out what they are. Okay. <laughs> I don't um, know which Barbara, species that is. I, I, I believe mm -hmm. you. <laughs> Maybe Alicia will post it in down here. Uh, Barbara Barakova um, uh, asked if you have, if you find any evidence of any cross veins in any of the red chanterelle species. Yeah, you do see that commonly in Cantharellus cinnabarinus, but you could see it in Coralinus. Um, in that interveining or cross veining doesn't seem to be restricted to any one species. Like I said, it's also an intensissimus, which is closely related. So I suspect all, yeah, all of those species have some degree of it. Okay. Um, Amata asks about the Cinnabarinus and or Coralinus, if you need more of them. Um, Amata has them every year so far 
out of Alabama oh, on the nice. southern tip of Cumberland. Yeah, I'm not sequencing any red chanterelles right now, but if you're able to keep specimens, I mean, I recommend anyone who has the ability, if you find something that you think is unique and interesting and you have a, a food dehydrator and you can keep them in a Ziploc bag, it's never a bad idea to keep specimens, you know, keep some notes with it. Um, and then maybe down the line, you know, somebody will sequence them. Okay. I have two more here and then I'm gonna hand over to Brooke to ask a few more. So here's the two left on my list. Um, do you think Cyber Cybarius was imported into North America on tree roots? Hmm. That's a great question because we see that in like Amanita, right? Travels the globe with its tree host. Um, I think that it's um, it's more likely my guess is that it's in North America because it's been there for a really long time rather than coming over. I think that it has a wider distribution than we previously thought. And if anything, maybe it's found in small areas of multiple continents because its range has shrunk over time rather than expanded through being introduced. Interesting. Thank you. That's my hypothesis. Um, Alicia Milliken asked, are there any um, are there toxic members of Cantharellus elsewhere in the world? That's a great question. Uh, I don't know of any off the top of my hand that are toxic, but um, you know, I can't, I can't discount it. I have to, I have to find out more. Okay. Brooke, do you want to hop in and ask a few from the next set? Yeah, let me rip through them. Um, Mandy Quark asked, what is the best way to upload an RPB2 sequence to GenBank? And it might be something that you need to communicate with Mandy about, but I wanted to ask it. Yes, it is a little more complicated than an ITF sequence, but feel free to email me if you want more detailed instructions. Groovy. Uh, did you try, Renee LaBeouf asks, did you try to sequence the type of Cantharellus sabarius variety pallidifolius? No, I haven't. Um, yeah, like I said, there's there's more more to be done. Haven't done that. Groovy. Um, uh, could you comment generally on chanterelle slash fungi in the fossil record? And then the other part of that question, this is from someone whose name I can't parse out, but it's like a website. But uh, do you, so fossil record, and then do you have to focus mainly on genetic testing to determine evolutionary relationships? Two part. Yeah, so those are great questions. We have fossil fungi, but they are very few compared to plants or animals. No doubt about it. There are no fossils from the cantharellales, for example, the chanterelles and allies. So that does make inferring um, evolutionary dates in history a little bit more difficult, but we're still able to do that when we do have um, DNA data. So yeah, we rely heavily on DNA data to reconstruct evolutionary relationships. But the nice thing is having that data, we can infer things like um, deep evolutionary time where deep splits occurred in the tree just by um, substitution rates of DNA nucleotides. Cool. Love your, your, your answers are so good too. The questions are great, your answers are great. We're ripping through. Okay, Ellie Han Hainowski asks, have you looked at Alaska species? I haven't personally, no. I mean, I would expect that you'd have some species from the Pacific Northwest, but you know, that's as much as I know. Okay. Uh, this is, I'm going to combine a question from Ali and also C.T. Perez. Ali asks, what advice do you wish you had gotten when considering a career in biology, mycology? And C.T. asks, I'm uh, uh, about your PhD, I'm in a microbiome program currently and wanted to ask at what point you began to steer your career in this direction. So I think people want to know how you became Rachel Sweeney. <laughs> yeah, I had a really, um, I, maybe you'd say non-traditional path to mycology. Um, I didn't study biology as an undergraduate and I got into mushrooms after my undergraduate research. Uh, I actually studied um, photography as an undergraduate. I worked for a nonprofit in Chicago and I built a mushroom lab and started a mushroom farm 
under the umbrella of this nonprofit and decided I was interested in mushroom diversity beyond just farming mushrooms and then started doing research from there. And so I would say, you know, what sort of advice that I wish I had? Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't, <laughs> I really didn't listen to much advice when I went into mycology. I was really following what interested me. And um, I think that you have a lot of options, no matter what your background is. And no matter if you're studying microbiology or something else, I think you should let your interest lead you, especially if you're contemplating a PhD program. PhDs are really long. They're a lot of work and you have to really like what you're doing because otherwise you probably won't make it through several years of studying that. So that'd be my advice to anyone who's thinking about becoming a professional mycologist. You heard it here. Uh, we have two <laughs> questions left. Uh, the first one is in the yellow chanterelles, are there, this is uh, Ludovic Le Renard. In the yellow chanterelles, are there any good microscopic features to look for to distinguish species? Okay, repeat that again, please. Sure. sure. Um, in or among the yellow chanterelles, are there any good microscopic species to look for to distinguish species? I guess he's asking, is there? Yeah. yeah. So there are spore size differences. So, for example, Cantharellus altipes is a golden chanterelle that has notably larger spores than other species, but there are a couple of other species that also have large spores. So I would look at spore size. If you look at spore size initially, that's a good start, but then you still want to consider habitat and um, especially yeah, trees that are present. Um, as far as any other microscopic characteristics, there are, um, there is the pilipellus structure. So some people have looked at the cell um, wall thickness and pilipellus, and that can be useful too. So it sort of depends, but with um, golden chanterelles, you don't have a whole lot to go off of microscopically other than those two features. Hmm. Um, wonderful. Uh, last question, then I, then I have one. Uh, Rodney from Appalachia Fungorum asks, harvesting, cut them or pull them? Does it matter? <laughs> uh, there's no evidence that it matters either way. So I, I when I collect chanterelles, especially for research, you do want to get the whole mushroom from the base. I mean, that's just sort of general uh, chanterelle harvesting for research 101. Chanterelles in general, you're not going to necessarily get a lot of information from the base other than maybe if you have um, Cantharellus corallinus and you have like that white pigmentation at the base, but um, yeah, whatever you like for the table. Good to know, you, you heard that here too. Um, so my question is, what are the chances that you would publish something resembling a field guide to all these Cantharella species, a monograph with pictures in color for people like me who tend to rely on pictures in color, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, I would love to do a sort of like a North American field guide. That would be more ambitious. I would need a lot of, I would need a lot of collaborators. I would need uh, other people who live in other parts of the country. Um, I am working on a field guide to mushrooms of Southern Appalachians with some uh, co-authors. So that will include a lot of great photos of chanterelles from that region specifically. Um, so yeah, maybe we can go from there. That sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting a lot of kudos in the, in the chat and the Q&A, Rachel, the presentation is, I mean, it, it's redundant of me to say it. I wish that you could see all these people thanking you and and I certainly do. Thank you so much. It's just Thank wonderful. You. And you, you've served these up to us on a platter almost as delicious as one composed of cooked chanterelles. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning yeah, in. I, I learned a lot today too. Thanks so much. I'm, I'm not as expert as many of the, the people here. and. Um, I, I learned a lot by listening and watching, and I, and I may have taken a few screenshots of some of your slides, too. So thank you for that. Sure thing. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks, everyone, okay. for tuning in on a, on a weeknight. I appreciate it. Okay. And uh, on that note, we will sign off. And this 
pr this presentation will be put up onto our webinar page on our on our website in the next couple of days for uh, everyone to enjoy. So thanks to everybody. Bye bye. Thank you.